I hope you're hungry. I remember that's what my classmate said to me when we pulled up in front of his house when I brought him home. He was a great guy. And, you know, I went into the house and wasn't long after I got there that dinner was ready. And again, he said, I hope you're hungry. And we walked into the dining room. And Mrs. Decker had for four people, for Bill and his, the two of them and myself, prepared this meal. There was a ham and there was turkey. There were three kinds of vegetables. There were two kinds of potatoes. There were at least two different salads. And of course, you have to have a little bit of all of that. And then came the first dessert, which was a pie followed by the cake. And after getting up from the table, Mrs. Decker absolutely refused to let me help clean up. I waddled my way into the living room and sat down in the chair, and she was standing right there and said, can I fix you a sandwich? <laughs> and Bill looked at me across the room and just smiled and said, I told you to come hungry. <laughs> I thought of that this week, and it was interesting because the gospel all centers around Jesus being invited to a meal, which was not an unusual event. Jesus either is at a meal or talks about banquets with some frequency in the Gospels. But I thought about this one in particular. You know, first he, he's invited because they, they want to keep their eye on him. You know, they want to see who this Jesus is. They're not certain about him. And, you know, they're like a bunch of middle school kids in the cafeteria. You know, they're all kind of jockeying for a place at the table, trying to figure out what the pecking order is, you know, who's better than others, who gets to sit next to who. And, and you know, I can't help but think that he must have smiled a bit when he watched all of that and said, you know, guys, get a grip. Get a grip. Come on. You know, it's all about how other people see you. It wasn't about the meal. And you missed the point. You missed the point. No, oftentimes we see Jesus in conflict with the Pharisees, but you have to understand that Jesus probably was a part of the Pharisaic movement. I mean, first of all, he was called rabbi, and rabbis only functioned as teachers of the law in synagogues, which was all part of the Pharisaic movement. It had been around for about three, four hundred years by the time of the coming of Jesus. And, and so it was very prominent, and especially in every place except Jerusalem. But even there, by the time of Jesus, it had grown to become an established reality. And the synagogues were run by the Pharisaic party. Those people, they were a broad movement that had a great variety of thought. You know, they, they weren't a single-minded group by any stretch of the imagination. Jesus was invited to eat with them. Well, you only invite another Pharisee to eat in the house of a Pharisee. They don't eat with the others. They don't eat with Gentiles. They don't eat with people who are not observers of the law. And so the fact that Jesus was invited, they saw him as one of their own. The other thing that's true is that Jesus was a descendant of David, and, and that meant something in that first century. That was very important. That gave Jesus the right to preach in any synagogue he entered because of his role as a descendant of King David. And, and so Jesus had some prominence, and so it was not unusual to find him at dinner with these Pharisees. But you know, I find it interesting that Jesus was harsh on religious people. Do you notice that? I mean, the woman caught in adultery, he just said, oh, don't do that anymore, just go in peace, you know? He offers forgiveness to so many, and you know, with the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, these religious leaders, 
there's a conflict with them. Not all of them. Obviously, some of them really accepted Jesus. We see evidence of that in the gospel. But there were many that were opposed to him. They didn't agree. They didn't like his way of interpreting the law. They said he didn't get it right. And you have to wonder, okay, what was the problem? What was the point of conflict? Why? You know, and I think it comes down to attitude, motivation. These were religious people. I mean, they did what they were supposed to do. They followed the law. They were law-abiding people. They weren't troublemakers. They were people who were very much intent on doing whatever they thought God expected of them, and they did that. They paid tithes scrupulously. They made sure that a tenth of all they had went to the Lord. They were people who did exactly what they were supposed to do. They probably prayed twice a day in the synagogue, and they observed all the rules of kosher. These were not bad people. They weren't. But the question is, okay, why do you do it? Why? You know, why did you come to church? That's a good question. What brings us here? What's the motivation? You know, the problem with these Pharisees, well, they liked God. They did. They just didn't need God. And that's a crucial difference. They weren't like the people that came to Jesus all the time. They weren't the little ones that came to listen to him preach on the hillside or by the lake or in the synagogues. Those people came because they needed God. They needed they were hurting, some of them because they were ill, some of them because they felt oppression, some of them because life was just so much of a struggle. They needed God. They were looking for some sort of help and consolation. They were people who wanted mercy because they recognized that sin had created a distance between themselves and God. They were people who we're looking for kindness and gentleness and love. They were looking for heartfelt compassion because they felt none in a world that was cruel. And they saw that in Jesus again and again and again. And they kept coming to him just because they wanted that gift of Christ. They wanted a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of kindness, a God of compassion, God, who cares? It wasn't about rules. It wasn't about doing what God expects. It was about living a relationship with God, about walking each day with God. You know, that's the way the Jewish people started their time. You know, they were slaves for 400 years in the land of Egypt. And then God rescued them through a series of miraculous events and then for 40 years, God led them in the desert and fed them, took care of them. And, and they learned, at least in those 40 years, to depend on God, to walk with God each day, to do whatever it is that God asked of them. You know, and so if God said it's time to go a little to the next oasis, they got up, packed everything up, and they went. And they stayed there until God told them to move on to the next place. They sought the will of God. They, they wanted to do that. No, 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 no. You know, that's the way they started. And yet somehow, these Pharisees, some thousand years later, they lost all that. They were doing what they thought they were supposed to do. But they didn't need God. They were quite able to do whatever it is that God asked of them. They were very good at that, but they didn't need God. They didn't hunger and thirst for holiness. You know, that's one of the attitudes that Jesus calls us to when he gave us the great Sermon on the Mount. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the merciful, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. No, no. No, Jesus was very compassionate, kind, and gentle with those who came hungering and 
bloodthirsty, who needed God. And it speaks to me, at least, of the attitude that I should bring when I come here. I come here not because I'm better. I might know a few things more than some of you, but that's okay. You know, that doesn't make me any more. In fact, because I stand up here, it means that I should be more. It requires more of me, because now I have to live what I actually say. <laughs> that's the toughest part. You know, but in the end, that's what I'm called to do. No, I, I, I need to be here because I need a savior. I need to hear his word. And I need to be with him at the table. I, I need to be fed on him so that with that gift of Christ, I can walk more faithfully as one of God's own. I can clothe myself in heartfelt compassion and mercy and kindness. I, I can do that, or at least try to do it a little bit better each day. But in the end, my brothers and sisters, you know, I think the point of difference between the Pharisees and Jesus, at least the ones that he was in conflict with, is there were those who liked God but didn't really need God. And then there were those who recognized that need. My brothers and sisters, I think back to that meal at the Decker's home years ago. And I hope you're hungry. I hope you came here hungry tonight. Hungry for the word. Hungry for the Lord. Because those who hunger and thirst for holiness, those who hunger and thirst for the Lord, Jesus said, you'll be satisfied.